I've just got a couple of housekeeping things first. There will be a Q&A after Dad talks, so think up some questions for him. And also, Dad has a blog. You can follow it at russellfreebird.com. My dad first came to the CSA in 1942 with Jack Terry and Bob Walton and three other friends from Galesburg, Illinois, before they went into World War II. They stayed at the Terry Cottage for three weeks and had a laugh. So, in 1965, when Mom and Dad were trying to decide where we would go on vacation, Dad said, let's give Crystal Lake a try. We came, we loved it, and we never left. <laughs> Dad loved his job as a reporter. He thought Washington bureau chief was the best job ever. He would have done that job forever also, but the Tribune forced him to go back to Chicago to become managing editor. Oh, wait, I probably shouldn't have told you that because if you haven't read the book, I might have just spoiled the ending. <laughs> My dad, if you talk to him, you'll realize he's a news junkie. He knows about everything, even today. With the invention of the internet, he's on that. He's watching TV. When I was working, and I only got to come up for one or two weeks a summer, I used to pray before I came that there be no big event happening in the world. <laughs> an impeachment, an earthquake. OJ driving around on the LA freeway because dad would be glued to that TV and there'd be no golf, no beach, no nothing. My dad has a love hate relationship with his computer. You see, I've been his tech support for 30 years <laughs> through two books the CSA history book, and the memoir. The stories I could tell you. Well, maybe just one. Dad wrote his memoir over five years. So we have a lot of backups. And that is a good thing. Frequently, I'd be lying on my bed in the cottage, reading a book, <coughs> very happy, and I'd hear this big sigh. <laughs> You see, like most cottages, our bedrooms are right next to each other, and the walls are very thin. Then Dad would yell, I just lost three pages. Can you come get them back? I don't know what happened. I didn't do it. <laughs> Last week, at lunch, Dad said 14 words I hoped never to hear. Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, I think I've got a really good idea for a fiction book. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, here's my dad, Russ Freeman. years old myself, 
I appreciate myself being here. <laughs> you know, the, the long life I've uh, lived certainly has provided me with an opportunity to look back, to use, and to reflect on incidents, both personal and professional. I think Holly Pangolet cat out of the bag that I'm a journalist. <laughs> and many of you already knew that. But I was a journalist for a quarter of a century, with more of a more than a decade spent in Washington in the middle 1900s. And I'll recall some incidents of that experience. But first I want to make a few remarks about the changing and disruptive media world we currently live in. It was, a, it was an ink-stained mechanical world of typewriters and printing presses when I began my career in 1948. Not, not our new digital age. The word cyberspace was not a part of our vocabulary. Television was just a period. Newspapers were king of the information world. But now television is giving away to streaming by, via iPads and iPhones. I cut the cord is a common expression regarding cable and also the telephone. So cyberspace, for good or evil, is the reality. In the world wide web, everyone is a global neighbor. Thoughts are shared. Think Twitter. But do we get the hard facts that are crucial to wise decisions? Or are we moving into an Orwellian world of fake news and deceit? With a poisonous political polarization underway, both individually and with the political parties, we are developing what I call constituency journalism. It's a journalism dominated by opinions rather than facts. We used to be a nation of hard news. It is said that nothing is forever, and I've lived long enough and experienced enough to, knew that, to know there is truth in that saying. The Chicago Tribune, where I work, is now a skeleton of its former self. It's left its longtime newsroom in a iconic Tribune Tower for a floor in the Prudential Office Building across the Chicago River. There is nothing left physically that connects me to that thing. The tower, bought by real estate developers, is being converted into condos selling for millions of dollars. It is one more sign that the strong and powerful newspaper industry that I knew and loved is fading away. The decline is ominous. In a 2018 article of the Washington Post, Margaret Sullivan wrote that research shows that newspapers still produce 85% of what we call account accountability journalism. That's journalism that unearths corruption and exposes <coughs> abuse of power. I have a melancholy feeling every time a paper folds because something important is at stake. It's the protection of free, unfettered press provides for us all. There is something solid and lasting about the printed word. It doesn't float away in the ether like the spoken word. So many of the words used over the airways and cable, all those modifying adjectives and adverbs, those annoying interchanges between talking heads, are often useless, even detrimental to reporting the news. They create emotions that rob a listener of independent thought and a power to think things through. 
it, it, it's too early to say that the digital revolution will be a success. Not technically, we know it's a success te technically, but in positive ethical, ethical and moral ways. With the change to online editions of newspapers and magazines, along with the social media platforms and cable, news is updated minute by minute throughout the day and night. And as a result, news comes at the public with lightning speed. There is no longer time to digest the news in a systematic fashion, to have a contemplative lag, to absorb in one's mind what has just been reported. Chaos, disrupt, disruption, even anxiety occur daily. I don't think it's a healthy development, physically or mentally. And increasingly, the personalities and personal lives of politicians are being reported rather than the laws they make and the policies they espouse. You know, gossip is easy to cover. Uh, it's simply less work. And a lot of this goes back to People Magazine. People Magazine, uh, we began reporting on, on people rather than on facts. So let's go to my days in Washington. The Latin American writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez once said, the life of a person is not what happened, but what he remembers and how he remembers it. So how do I remember mine? The nation's capital was a kinder and gentle, gentler place when I arrived there by train on the morning of December 29th, 1958. There wasn't the poisonous atmosphere that exists today. Republicans and Democrats got along with each other, both in work and socially. Congress was not dysfunctional like it is today. And I thought in my years in Washington that Congress was the greatest liberty body in the world. But no longer. But raising campaign money has become the holy grail of its members instead of passing laws to take care of our country's needs. Three long-running dramas took place during my years in Washington. The Cold War, Vietnam conflict and the civil rights movement. The Cold War ended with the Soviet Union and history's dust. <coughs> the deep wounds of Vietnam have slowly healed. The civil rights movement is not over and probably never will be. It will change in its aims, perhaps its racial makeup or ethnicity but an individual's desire to be free from bondage will always rule the heart and the mind. Vietnam was a thorny issue in my time in Washington. It led to President Johnson's downfall. But Eisenhower and Kennedy had sent several thousand military advisors to South Vietnam, as well as millions of dollars in military equipment and economic aid. Still, the South was unable to stand alone against the communist North Vietnamese. I covered four presidents actively when I was in Washington, and I had met others when they were governors. And I was covering the White House one morning when General Douglas and MacArthur came down from New York, where he lived in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in retirement, to discuss Vietnam with JFK. The general was uh, numb, numb about details of the meeting when he talked to reporters, but Ted Sorensen, the president's confidant and speechwriter, said in later years that the general advised Kennedy not to become involved in a land war on the Asian mainland. Kennedy discussed Vietnam with MacArthur on several occasions, and I've always believed Kennedy would have heeded MacArthur's advice. 
more so I will, I will never know. Sadly, LBJ didn't eat MacArthur. The Cold War never traveled in a straight line. There were alternate periods of calm and belligerence. Nikita Khrushchev, the Russian leader, came to Washington to visit Eisenhower, and then he toured the United States. And that was a calm time. But in October 1962 came a storm, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the most dangerous episode of the Cold War. The Soviet embassy in Washington seemed to be a mysterious place. Here was the philosophical enemy nesting in our nation's bosom. A rather spooky atmosphere pervaded it, an aura of curiosity that sent chills and excitement through one's body. My wife Sally, many of you knew her, was not immune to these feelings, but there also was a true grit in her character. She knew from experience that when we had out-of-town guests, the first thing they wanted to see was the White House, but the second thing was always the Soviet Embassy. A curious public, of course, had never been inside the very few people were ever seen going in and out of the building, which sat on a small patch of ground surrounded by a see-through black wrought iron fence. It had been purchased in 1913 by the Tsar's government from George Pullman, the maker of our old railroad sleeping cars. It was a handsome four-story edifice in a French architectural style with gray stone exterior and a slate manchured roof. But its windows were always shuttered. In fact, it lent favor to the grim feeling of the dream and sinister doings as people skipped past. Sally understood those feelings of mystery, and so did her closest friend, Sassy Boswell. They thought they could work those emotions to their advantage as co-chairs of the 1960 embassy tour of the Alexandria, Virginia Junior Women's Club. They knew having the Russians on board would be a game changer in attendance and money raised for the Alexandria School for Handicapped Children, the club's charity. So why not take a capitalistic approach to the communist world? <laughs> they wrote a letter to the Soviet ambassador to the United States, Mikhail Menchikov, inviting the embassy to be on the tour. A couple of weeks went by, and one day we received a letter typed on coarse brown paper asking them to visit the embassy to discuss arrangements. It was no secret in Washington that the FBI had an apartment in a building across the street from the embassy. And from there they filmed everyone going in coming out of the <laughs> So I got in touch with a college buddy, Bud Linebaugh, an assistant to J. Edgar Hoover at the FBI, and I told him the date of Sally and Sassy's visit and why. To say that the two women were excited as they entered the Soviet compound and walked to the heavy wooden front door and rang the bell is an understatement. <laughs> They also were, I think, a little apprehensive. But the meeting went well, and the Russians joined the other embassies on the tour. India, Iran, Malaya, Thailand, Japan, Turkey, and Argentina. I, I, I don't think Iran would be on that list. <laughs> so everything was in readiness for Saturday, October 22nd, 1960. The weather cooperated. It was a beautiful fall afternoon, but no one had, had anticipated what took place. An hour before the tour began, a line for a press assembled on the sidewalk outside the embassy, and it sneaked down the block and around a couple of corners past the entry to the Washington Post building. They were like fans waiting for a Frank Sinatra concert, <laughs> or maybe outside of an Apple store waiting to buy it. <laughs> or maybe a World Series game. 
<laughs> the post was roused to action and ran a photo of the line across the eight columns of his front page the next morning. Tour tickets were three dollars, so the money for charity rolled in. But the embassy abounded with communist literature, and when that ran out, the Russians went down in the building basement and dragged out some old books they had about their political philosophy for anyone interested. Sally had seen the embassy as a bit of free enterprise, and the Soviets were not going to let a chance slip by to convert someone to communism. Maybe in, maybe in the microcosm, the disparate aims for what the Cold War was all about. Even back then, the Russians were as interested in American politics as they are today. With the presidential election only days away, one embassy official asked Sally who she was back, Nixon or Kennedy. Hmm. He said he had seen a headline he liked very much. I tells Rocky, stay away from Jack and Dick. <laughs> so many nicknames, he said. <laughs> well, later on, during the Johnson administration, I had uh, my own encounter with a Russian, this time a task news agency correspondent by Tally Gann. In the 1960s, the Soviets went, wanted to establish consulate in Chicago. The effort did not go smoothly with the reigning politicians of the city, including its incomparable mayor, Richard J. Daly. In fact, the Chicago political leaders responded to the Russians as a hard and firm no. I often saw and occasionally talked to Gann at the State Department prison. So one afternoon as I was parking my car in the ellipse near the White House, Dan appeared seemingly out of nowhere. He said, I have a question to ask you. I told him to shoot away. Why is there opposition to us having a consulate in Chicago, he asked. I chuckled at that. Uh, when he was Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill used to say that all politics is local. I was sure Gann was not familiar with that bit of political philosophy. <laughs> there is a large Polish population on the northwest side of the city, I told Gann. I explained it was a large voting block, and Chicago's polls were against the consulate being established. I said it was the same with Lithuanians on the city's southwest side and that there were probably enough votes in the two groups to swing an election. A sly smile crossed Gann's face. Poland, Lithuania, both were under the Kremlin's yoke. After a moment of thought, he said, I see. I wasn't sure, however, that Gann really understood the hard fought and British auto style of politics though the word commissar was no doubt familiar to him. It's clear to him that it's doubtful he was familiar with terms like precinct captain or war leader. So by tally, I continue, there are many immigrants from Slavic and Eastern European countries in Chicago. They represent Kremlin domination of their native lands. They don't like their iron curtain. In Chicago, they can speak with their vote. I suggested to him that the Kremlin may be up against an unbeatable flaw. Like me, Gann is long gone from Washington, and there's still no Russian consulate in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was in World War II, and even in wartime, there are human interest tales, and this one geographically involves our Midwest. Well, it's One day, as my 8th Armored Division was driving deep into central Germany, I was pinned down by artillery fire in a German house. The shelling ceased eventually. But as I waited for the signal to move forward again, 
I sat down at a desk and began to rummage through the items and papers. I was dumbfounded as I picked up a colored postcard with the imprinted words, Greetings from Camp Ellis, Illinois. <laughs> I flipped it over in my hand, read the other side, and using my limited college German, I ultimately determined that the writer was a prisoner of war at Ellis. Mm -hmm. He wrote that he was healthy, and he hoped everything was well at home. The message was to a woman, maybe his wife, perhaps his mother, I didn't know, I wasn't sure. But there I was in his home, and he was only 20 miles or so from my home in Gillsburg. It was a strange feeling, this uh, wartime juxtaposition of uncertain odds. I had fleeting thoughts about where and when he was captured. Was it Normandy? Had he been in Rommel of Africa Corps? There in that room, it was his room really, I felt an intimacy, intimacy with a foe that I would never be and that I would never know. I never saw Camp Ellis, officially dedicated in July 1943 and closed in 1945. It came and went while I was away. The 18,000 acres of farmland we covered are, not, are mostly corn and soybean fields again. And the golden corn stalks rustle once more in the autumn winds. And the Spoon River, the camp border, winds its way slowly through the countryside. So let's, let's sum things up. I've lived through historic, historic changes during my lifetime. First there was the nuclear age. Then there was the jet age. Then there was the space age. Now there's DNA. <laughs> and there's this tremendous growth in monetary wealth. And of course in communications there's still there's the internet and TV. Television journalists now outnumber newspaper reporters in the capital by about two to one. A startling reversal of my first days in Washington when I rarely saw a TV reporter. Newspapers were supreme as I grew up. They only hit the street once in 24 hours. There was time for reflection before reaction. The world was orderly in receiving its news. And that ordinance was gone. I hope there will always be print reporters to walk the halls of government, to check on corruption and political skullduggery. They are inherently better at this than the electronic media. And so it goes. Thank you. Scotty Reston uh, wrote a wonderful column day after day. Uh, 
I knew both uh, Scotty and, and uh, Russ Baker, and they were uh, dedicated to their jobs. Uh, Russ Baker was a much better writer than I was, maybe, and Scotty certainly was. Uh, but they were fun to be around when uh, we weren't working. <laughs> uh, Scotty wrote a book once about the artillery of the press. Uh, so he was deeply involved. Russ Baker was deeply involved in trying to always get the facts, work to get the facts. As I said, uh, uh, without facts, you can never get to what, what, what is the truth. Who else has a question for Russ? And I'm going get, to get the microphone here so everybody can hear you, OK? <laughs> I just wondered today, given um, you know what you said about the facts, which media outlet, print, and or TV do you pay the most attention to, and do you think is best at sticking to the facts? <laughs> well, since we have a sparsity of facts today, and, uh, we have more and more opinions. Uh, I look at all the channels, skip back and forth. <laughs> I think over, the, I haven't watched a, a, an over the air newscast in, in 15 years. Uh, I stick pretty much to cable, uh, despite all the faults of the three cable networks. But they, I wouldn't rate them. Hmm. I'll tell you that uh, Fox News has by far the largest uh, viewership. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they, they daily run around, or at night, say they run around 2.4 million. MSNBC runs about 1.4 million. CBS is about 900,000. For some, it's the weakest uh, cable network. Question. <laughs> what do you think about realclearpolitics.com as a on-site source? I read realclearpolitics.com. I take out of it uh, uh, what's there. Uh, I don't know how I, I don't know how I would rate it in my own mind. It's just a, it's another source to read. The more, the more sources I read, the, the better informed I am. Uh, you'll, you'll laugh when I say this, but uh, the, uh, the uh, blog drug, drug uh, sometimes is where you get the best story. <laughs> because all he's doing is, is putting on there what he's found in other places. So I, I, I watch uh, Drudge, I would call up Drudge on the internet, uh, I read the Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, I don't subscribe to all of those, but I look at the headlines and uh, the Wall Street Journal has a paragraph uh, beginning each story. Uh, I'll tell you this, as when you've been around journalism as long as I have, you inherently know what the rest of the story is going to be. <laughs> but uh, talking about uh, opinion journalism, I saw a headline the other day, and it said Trump unexpectedly tees off on Fox News. Well, there's one word in that headline that changed it from hard news to opinion, and that's unexpectedly. If you take out unexpectedly, it says Trump tees off on Fox News. That's 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 a fact. That's hard news. It's put in unexpectedly, and you've got an opinion piece. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Russ. Thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Uh, my question has to do with um, we talked previously, and you mentioned it a little bit in your book about how. 
jet travel changed life in Washington from uh, the families of all of the Congress kind of living together and the women socializing together during the day with their children and in the evenings, uh, cocktail parties across both sides of the aisle would meet. Um, do you think, or, well, I don't think it's going to come back, so in the near term anyway, do you have any more comments you'd like to make about that change in the socialism, the socialization uh, between parties in Washington life? Dave, there are two parts to that. The answer has two parts to it. It's true that the jet, jet age changed Washington. When I, when I arrived there, it was just a sleepy little southern town. But with the jet age, lobbyists, uh, corporate executives, whoever had a Something they wanted done in Washington could, could jet to Washington and some of them could be home for dinner. So that, that came before, before the jet age. Uh, a lot of the uh, trade associations that are now in Washington and are lobbying, a lot of them were in Chicago, or most of them were in Chicago because Chicago was the hub of the railroad uh, lines all, all over the world and Chicago was easy to get to by rail. But that all changed with the, with the, with the jet planes. Uh, it just cut the time for them to get there. Uh, there's another element involved here with, with uh, the uh, change in Washington. And uh, this has to do partly with the uh, social change. Congress uh, after many years of an allowance to return home to your district once every month. Change the law so they could go home four times every month. Before that took place, uh, they, most of them stayed in Washington uh, for most of the time. They had families there. There was a lot, of, I said in Washington, it was a small town. There were dinner parties. Democrats, Republicans would be, would be invited there together. Uh, they would always end at 10 o'clock so they could be fresh in the morning to do the work on the hill. That change from one week to four weeks has led to part of what you see today. They don't know each other. Uh, they sleep in their offices, some of them, not all of them. Some of them sleep in their offices. They take their shower in the gymnasium. They shave in the gymnasium. Uh, they don't need to live in, a, in a, an apartment or a house. And that's what you have today. Uh, and so those two things, I think, the jet age and that change in their uh, allowances when they get home, the time they were allowed to go home, I think those two things are largely responsible for what you see today. I just wondered, uh, despite all the divisiveness in Washington and everywhere, what gives you hope? Yeah. What did I what? <laughs> what gives you hope? What gives you hope? Hope for the future. What do I hope for the future? <laughs> what do you, you, you think? Despite all the divisiveness, what gives you hope? Well, you should always have hope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how soon this will end. Uh, it, as I said in the speech talking about an Orwellian world, uh, the, the Democrats and Republicans are so far apart today uh, in their beliefs and in their aims. Uh, I suppose what you would eventually get would be one party would become really, really, uh, become a one party town. I don't, I don't see anything changing uh, very soon, if ever. Uh, I think I think folks we gotta get used to this tech world, technical world we live in. 
and, and somehow uh, adjust to it. There are times that uh, I get fed up with uh, watching the news, and, and I don't watch it for three or four days, uh, and something happens that I want to catch up on. I think you've just got to uh, uh, turn it out. Uh, and maybe in our lifetimes, most of us here are older people, uh, there, there won't be any change. Thanks, Russ, for speaking to us. Um, I'm reading a book right now called Raven Rock, and it's about the continuity of government that was started during the Cold War and the Eisenhower administration and carried through other administrations. And one of the questions I have for you is uh, they were going to allow some journalists to say during the nuclear holocaust. Uh, were you one of those people? <laughs> Did you know anybody who was going to get bugged out to Raven Rock or any of these other places that they had uh, set up for survival of the government? Well, when the, uh, when the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, came about, uh, the Washington Bureau of the Tribune had to decide how it was going to cover it. And we decided that we would uh, have uh, reporters around the clock at the White House and the Pentagon, except for a few hours between uh, uh, 2 a.m. and, and uh, 5 a.m. in the morning. I was uh, assigned to be at the Pentagon from 5 o'clock at night until 2 in the morning. I only grew up two stories during that time. Uh, Phil Dodd, who was our regular correspondent, covered it daily. He, he did the bulk of the writing. Uh, I sometimes wondered why Sally and the kids didn't hop in, the, in their station wagon and take off, but uh, where could they go? Uh, those missiles could uh, be fired off of Cuba. They could go as far as Hudson Bay in Canada. They could go as far as Purdue, uh, Peru, and South America. Uh, I call, at 10 o'clock every night, I called my dad in Galesburg and told him it looked like we'd survived another day. As, as the crisis went on, I think everyone became more and more confident that we weren't going to have a nuclear war. Uh, and, uh, when they decided, they, I mean, the, the executive committee and, and the White House and Kennedy, when they, when they de decided what they were going to do, that was uh, what they eventually called a quarantine, which was a blockade is a term that's a term of war. And they didn't want to use blockade, so they used quarantine. But they put up a line of ships to stop any Soviet, to inspect any Soviet ship and, and to uh, turn it back if it had any uh, offensive weapons on it. That gave, that gave uh, everyone time to negotiate. Kennedy and uh, Khrushchev sent several letters back and forth. Uh, I would have been better off trailing Bobby Kennedy than uh, being at the Pentagon, he and uh, uh, the Soviet ambassador were, were meeting every night about two or three in the morning, either at the Justice Department or in the Soviet Embassy. And out of that finally came uh, the, the message that Bobby carried to uh, Dobrynian, the ambassador, and to the Soviets was that we eventually would take out some offensive missiles we had in Turkey. Uh, and then they would then take out the missiles they had in Cuba. The missiles we had in Turkey were obsolete, so we didn't really care to take them out. But uh, I think Khrushchev became very, very frightened of what was happening. And you could tell that uh, by what eventually took place. Would you still encourage young people to go into journalism or to study journalism? Well, yes, I would. Um, you have, you know, you have this rough style of blogs all over the internet, and if 
these people uh, are sincere in what they're doing. Uh, you have a lot of journalists uh, doing blogs, and this the internet's available to millions and millions and millions of people. So yes, I would encourage people who went to journalism. Uh, Something will always be around, even if you get down to streaming uh, and looking at uh, stories on the iP iPad or iPhones. Someone's going to have to generate it. Uh, and I would. I think a person has to follow his own destiny, and if there are reporters who want to still try to uh, save print journalism. I'd be all for them to do it. Uh, but the, the number keeps shrinking. I think there are 89,000 print journalists are roughly left in the United States. You divide that into 50 states, and there aren't many in, in, in any one of the 50 states. As I said, you have a lot more television journalists. They, they, they could be a little tighter with their language. <laughs> Stick more to the facts. Yes, Kate. Um, I'm old enough that when I was in high school, Hitler uh, came to power in Germany. I see so much of the same going on now, and it's very frightening to me. You and I are the same age, so it seems to me you must be concerned, as I am, that we're losing um, uh, that freedom of the press that we enjoyed at one time, and um, there are many things that we're alienating to our friends around the world, um, which uh, am I just being naive to? be afraid, or um, do you feel some of that same fear? Well, I, I don't have any fear, really. Anybody else? So, yeah, time, time, sometimes it's, it's tough. Uh, with what, what's going on, and uh, I suppose you're referring to Trump. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not sure that, in fact, I know that Trump does not have the personality to be president. But, but don't be surprised, folks, if he's real. Uh, he has tremendous political instinct. I mean, you know, he, he might go after a foe with the intensity of a junkyard dog, but uh, when that when that target is, the person he's targeted, when it's all over, that person that person is bits and pieces all around the ground, and uh, the Democrats will have to come up with. Uh, Pretty good candidate to uh, to defeat to defeat Bruce. So uh, we have one last question. Yeah, we we line this up. Sorry. What will be the topic of your next book? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to write anymore. <laughs> Maybe write a little thing about it. Several weeks, uh, several uh, weeks ago, I was reading the Week magazine. A couple of weeks ago, I was reading the Week magazine, and it occurred to me that a lot of the sources they were using were all the same. So I, I, I took the four of May, the four magazines of May, and I tallied each time the source was used. And uh, I uh, 
I titled the piece, East of the Alleghenies. <laughs> uh, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and Bloomberg News were by far the sources they used time after time after time. Uh, they used a few up and down the East Coast. They used the LA Times. I think they quoted the LA Times nine times uh, in the four weeks out of a total of 11 papers or sources on the West Coast. Uh, one out of five journalists now work in either New York or Washington. Mm. Uh, that's not healthy, for sure. Uh, and so much of the and the television uh, companies are headquartered in New York. Uh, all, all of your mag monthly magazines, weekly magazines that you read are published in New York. Uh, you know, and here we are in flyover country, and a lot of those people have not the slightest idea of who we are or what we think, uh, and that's trouble. Well, 